discussions for 2020, uh, making our homes our own. Uh, I'm delighted that uh, so many of you have watched Professor Nick Hopkins' fasc fascinating lecture uh, on the Lord Commission's reports on leasehold enfranchisement and common hold, and have been able to join us for the uh, live discussion of some of the many issues which arise out of those reports. Now, uh, we'd be delighted to have your comments and questions for Nick and for the rest of the panel. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a button marked Q&A. And can you please use that button uh, to type your comment or question, please? Uh, and we'll see them as they come into us. I can't promise that we'll get through all of them, but we'll try to get through as many as we can. And uh, we're not going to do them in any particular order, so we will be switching around between leasehold enfranchisement and common hold as we go through. One thing I hope to be able to guarantee uh, is a better quality of discussion than any uh, US presidential debate that you may have seen uh, of late. Now, while you're busy typing your questions, can I just introduce uh, the panel for this evening? I'm Gary Cowan, QC. I practice at Fulton Chambers. Uh, and I took Silk this year, and I'm also the co-author of a, a book on common hold uh, published by the Law Society. Um, you've already watched Professor Nick Hopkins' excellent lecture. Nick is the Law Commissioner for Property, Family and Trusts Law, and was the lead commissioner for the uh, Commission's work on common hold uh, and leasehold enfranchisement. He holds a chair in law at Reading University, and he's widely published on uh, a numerous legal property issues. Um, Natasha Rees is head of enfranchisement group at Forsters LLP and has a wealth of experience in this area, uh, including acting in some of the leading cases such as Sportelli and Agio, and more recently in Oldford House. Uh, and Tony Rudevsky is Mr. Enfranchisement, uh, also a member of Falcon Chambers, co author of the leading textbook, Hague on Leasehold Enfranchisement. Tony is seemingly in every leading case uh, on the subject, and there really isn't anything that he doesn't know about leasehold enfranchisement. So, so that's our panel for this evening. Uh, whilst you're typing your questions, perhaps I can ask Natasha to kick off uh, with the first question for Nick. Well, thank you very much, Gary. And um, thank you, Nick, for an excellent lecture. Um, the first question is a fairly obvious one, but it's a question that we are asked a lot particularly by tenants who are considering whether to enfranchise. As we know, it can take time from a, from a report being published to the law being enacted. The abolition of leasehold houses is a good example of this. Uh, we, are, we now have the added complications of Brexit and coronavirus. Are there any recent indications from the government as to timing and when these reforms might become law? Yep. Thanks, Natasha. Um, the, the, the short answer is that the, the, the decisions on that are now in, in government's hands. So we, we've published our reports. Uh, as you say, that, that doesn't mean the law changes. The, these are just our, our recommendations. Government has to consider them uh, and then, uh, assuming they are accepted, uh, legislation has to be uh, drawn up to go through Parliament. Um, so we don't have uh, timings. That's now in government's hands. I think what we do see is that there there remains very significant interest in leasehold reform. Um, we launched the reports at a, a meeting of the All Party Parliamentary Group of Leasehold and Common Hold, which was very well attended uh, by uh, politicians from sort of both Commons and Lords. So it is clearly on the agenda. Um, we're you know, feeling very positive uh, that this is work that will uh, be uh, implemented, uh, but the decisions on that and the timing of legislation uh, ultimately lie outside of our hands. Thank you. I suppose uh, one other short question was just that the fact that they're all sort of, they've all been published together. Is it envisaged that they will move forward together? Again, I suppose that, yeah, that, 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 that is uh, a matter that the government would have to decide. Um, the reason we publish them together is because there are the fairly clear policy connections between them. Um, and so we were developing policy 
uh, across the reports at the same time to make sure that our, our own policy decisions were sort of consistent uh, in that respect and that when we uh, did decide uh, to make different recommendations uh, you know, for uh, enfranchisement and the right to manage for example uh, that we had thought through uh, why we were taking a, a, a different direction. Um, so you know, th th that it doesn't mean that they have to be taken forward uh, together um, but we, you know, we do see them as a, as a package uh, of reforms. Um, Nick, can I ask a question about Common Hold? Um, one of the, the, the kind of keystones that I think comes out of the report on um, Common Hold reforms is a desire to give leaseholders more autonomy and more yep. control over their, their homes. Um, I, I'd like to ask about the proposals for conversion from existing leasehold developments um, into Common Hold, and in particular the way in which and um, the proposals deal with non-participants who've chosen for wh whatever reason not to um, participate in the conversion to common hold. And as, as I understand it, there are these two options which were in the consultation paper and which are now in the report. Okay. Okay. But, so option one is to leave the non-participators as leaseholders um, following conversion to common hold with the common hold association taking over as um, freeholder of in effect of their common hold unit until such times as they come to sell that leasehold interest at which point it will become compulsory for for the the purchaser to then convert to common hold and option two is to effectively force all leaseholders to convert to common hold at the same time but in relation to those who are non-participants um, not to um, make them pay for that at the time of the conversion but to place a charge on their um, now freehold common hold unit um, to, be, to be dealt with at the time that they come to then sell that unit. Um, do you think that and, and, and the, the, the report favours option two rather than option one but what struck me was that option two was really um, rather less consistent with the idea of giving more control to leaseholders because in effect you are forcing them to do something which on the face of it they're they're not um, willing to do at the time of the the initial conversion to leasehold um, and i just wanted to see what your thoughts were on that and maybe expand on that a little bit yeah <clears throat> sure thanks gary and as you say they are the, the two options that we put forward of how to deal with the non-participants uh conversion of course is uh possible under the current law but needs a hundred percent uh, agreement uh, of leaseholders plus some other uh holders of interest in the property and one of the things we were specifically asked to look at was how to make common hold uh, viable for existing homeowners as well as uh, new homeowners and conversion is obviously uh, key to that um, once you move away from unanimity which we uh, saw essential to, to making conversion more possible uh, you're faced with the question of how do you then uh, uh, treat those who don't uh, participate um, and the two options we put forward are, are essentially the, the, the only two options you have you either lead them as leaseholders uh, or uh, you uh, say that they have to become common hold unit owners uh, as well um, we took the view that when you look at um, the management of the uh, block following a conversion uh, the benefits of common hold uh, are going to be uh, achieved uh, much more cleanly uh, if everyone in the block uh, takes uh, a, a common hold uh, and so we took the view that uh, on it, it, it as far as managing that block in the future is concerned requiring conversion uh, is uh, the, the, the better way forward. Uh, now that does mean that people who don't participate um, are required to convert um, we can't assume that everyone who doesn't participate isn't happy 
about converting. It could be that, that they want to convert but don't have the finance. Uh, equally, of course, it is perfectly fair to say there may be some who actively don't uh, want to convert and would rather remain uh, as leaseholders. Um, but the view we took is that when you, when you balance the kind of competing interests of uh, those who aren't participating uh, with those who want to get the benefits of common hold, uh, requiring uh, everyone to convert uh, gives the, the the cleaner option, and and so that's why we we preferred that. But it does have the funding uh, challenge uh, that you uh, have highlighted, uh, and so we have put forward the alternative. Um, approach of enabling uh, non-participants to stay as leaseholders. We see that as being uh, essentially a longer transition period because even though they would remain uh, as leaseholders, uh, the idea would be that those leases do um, convert to common hold in due course. So, you know, for example, either because uh, the, uh, the the leaseholder wants to enfranchise, and so rather than buying an extended lease, uh, they would buy the common hold um, unit, the, the freehold title, uh, or because they sell uh, the unit, in which case the buyer would have to uh, to, to buy the freehold title. So it, it essentially comes down to looking at, at what's going to work best for managing that block uh, in the future. We think uh, sort of through that lens, um, requiring conversion. Um, is the, the the preferred way? I mean, it, it's it seemed to me that it's kind of it's almost the lesser of two evils because you've got with option two, um, as you say, um, fu the funding issues which which are yeah. significant and yeah. and you know obviously we're trying to incentivize people to use common hold and if if one of the key steps in that process is effectively funding the purchase of common hold units for people who can't do it at the time of conversion then it's going to have to be attractive to investors or lenders to be able to do that and at the moment it's not quite clear certainly in my mind how how it becomes attractive to a lender to to, to enter into that market yeah yeah I'd, I'd agree and that and that's why we we felt the funding uh on that basis if um if non-participants are going to be required to convert to common hold, uh, the funding will probably have to take the form of um, a, a shared equity type loan. Um, so essentially, uh, that where where government currently provides shared equity loans to help people get on the housing ladder in the first place, um, it would uh, need to provide an equivalent scheme uh, to enable those who are currently leaseholders to convert to common hold um, to, to become freeholders. Thanks, Nick. Um, Tony? Yes, could I ask you a, a question about your valuation report on enfranchisement? Um, one of the valuation options which you uh, put forward is to limit the rent payable to 0.1% of the freehold value. Uh, now that would be of enormous help to the many people who are trapped in leases with ground rents doubling every 10 years, who are not being compensated by the original developer. Uh, is there a case for enacting that now, rather than waiting for the perhaps several years that a comprehensive new statutory regime is likely to take? Um, or is it realistically part of the whole package that you're proposing? Mm. Yeah, and so as you say, we our valuation report is slightly different to the others because uh, we don't set out recommendations. We were asked to provide government with options, um, which sort of acknowledges that there are political decisions to be made uh, around price. And so we set out a number of options uh, for reform, and then we we set out. Uh, sort of sub options uh, that could be combined with any scheme that government chose uh, to adopt um, and the, the the cap on ground rent or cap on how ground rent is calculated when somebody enfranchises it is one of those sub options um, I think that the difficulty is you could look at any recommendation that we make in the main report or indeed uh, you know, a number of the 
options we put forward in the valuation report um, and say, well, look, that will help a category of leaseholder. Uh, so why not do that now rather than uh, wait for um, comprehensive uh, reform? Um, but, but any piecemeal reform is only going to make is only going to help a particular category. So taking forward that the, the ground rent cap on enfranchisement prices, as you rightly say, will be a huge benefit for those with uh, the 10 times doubling ground rent, but it doesn't help anyone else. Um, sort of similarly, uh, adopting our uh, option on calculating the price of term and reversion, but no marriage value, um, will uh, it, it help leaseholders uh, with shorter leases enormously now, but won't do anything uh, for those with longer leases who, who wouldn't be liable to pay marriage value in any event. Um, so we see this a, as a package uh, of reforms. And in order to, to help the greatest number of leaseholders, you have to take that forward as a package rather than just pick off individual uh, Bits. I suppose the other thing wor worth noting is that you know, most of what we have recommended and most of the options we put forward in the valuation report require primary legislation uh, in any event. Um, so given that you, you need to get something into Parliament, I suppose the question would be, what, why would you only put one bit in uh, well, rather than doing as much as you, as you could? Yes, I suppose the, the answer maybe to, to this particular point is that the doubling ground rent problem seems to be particularly acute for people who were perhaps uh, misled into buying their leases without realising the, the doubling ground rent problem. Uh, and are not really able to sell um, without a more urgent remedy. But I, I, I entirely understand what you say. Yeah. Would I, can I just add one yeah. further question on ground rent, which one of uh, the participants has raised on a, on a question, um, which is that um, they point out uh, that under the report, you are not allowing uh, a leaseholder to retain the payment of ground rent on a lease extension um, and as this person points out that will cause the premium to be higher because the person the lessee will have to buy out the ground rent um, do you not think that uh, you're taking an element of choice away from leaseholders who might prefer to carry on paying a ground rent rather than paying a capital sum to buy it out we did um, get consider that. We did consider quite carefully where you draw the line between giving uh, consumers choice on the one hand and putting forward a, a simple scheme on the other. Um, and I think it, in that respect, um, what we felt is that we, we know from the current experience of leaseholders that um, they don't always understand the decisions they are being asked to make. Leases, uh, we're used to them as lawyers, but leases are fundamentally very complex products. Um, we were concerned of the risk of leaseholders being uh, persuaded, uh, encouraged uh, to take deals that looked attractive at face value. Um, but which uh, w w were not necessarily uh, as good a deal as they looked, if too much of the choice uh, is left um, for them. Um, so we took the view uh, in relation to uh, ground rent, it was better to have the, the cleaner scheme, uh, which guarantees to leaseholders that when they enfranchise, they get a peppercorn ground rent. Um, and rather than putting in place a, a choice of keeping, uh, that ground rent, uh, reducing the impact that ground rent has on the price in the first place. So, so we didn't really think it was then necessary. It, I mean, it sends out a bit of a mixed message, I think, to say on the one hand, we want the ground rent to be uh, a peppercorn on, on extension. Uh, but on the other hand, um, we, we're, we're going to let a, a ground rent stay in place if, if that gives a, a slightly cheaper premium. We want the premiums to come down um, kind of sufficiently 
that uh, keeping a ground rent is not really going to be a sort of financially attractive option. But I mean, no, it's a perfectly uh, good question. It is something that we that we consider quite carefully when we when we put forward the options. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, I just thought I'd go back to the, the common hold and, and I had a, a few questions on that which have, have come in. And one is that um, leaseholders currently have to ask permission of their landlord uh, if they want to carry out any alterations to their flat. Um, and I suppose what will happen now it, it, on common hold is that they'll have to go to the common hold association. And the directors of the common hold association will be made up of the tenants. Uh, so you could find a neighbour that you don't get on with, uh, deciding whether or not you can carry out alterations. How, how has this sort of been dealt with in, in the um, proposed reforms and the sort of problems of neighbour disputes, which can be quite common? Yeah, and we, we, we have sought to put in place uh, sort of schemes of dispute resolution, uh, for example, uh, to, to try and ensure that when uh, sort of uh, issues arise, there is an informal uh, way of dealing with them. Um, I, I mean, I suppose that what you've highlighted is something that could happen uh, in a right to manage, it could happen after a, a collective enfranchisement has taken place. Um, th there is a limit to what the law can achieve because you know, we, we can put a legal structure in place, but no, to a large extent, the, the, the problems we're solving are the legal ones uh, with um, leasehold. But there is the whole other side that uh, you know, if you're living in a block of flats, you're living much closer to, to your neighbours, living cheap by jowl, as I think uh, sort of David Clark uh, sort of put it. Um, and so that the possibility of neighbourhood uh, disputes is that much uh, greater. Um, and we want those sort of disputes to be solved as, as informally uh, as possible. Thank you. I suppose that there might also be the problem of sort of investors buying up leases and flats um, and, and, you know, having a similar problem um, because the, the new reforms suggest that there won't be any limit on how many flats someone can own before they can collectively enfranchise. It's uh, you thinking of the, the, the three that the three flats yes. that you have in mind. Uh, yeah, that, that's right. I mean, we again, we looked at that very carefully. Um, it, it's not really an effective mechanism at the moment because uh, sort of multiple flat owners who are sophisticated uh, get over uh, uh, that limit. Uh, by using corporate structures, etc. Uh, so the only people who are really prevented from uh, taking part in a collective enfranchisement through it uh, are the, the sort of less sophisticated, less well-advised uh, multiple owners. Um, we did look to see if there's a way that uh, the sort of intention behind that rule could be carried forward in a different way. Um, but we sort of very quickly realise that any any mechanism we try to put in place or any way we anything we try to put in place to replicate that rule um, fell undone on the same basis that there would be a means of uh, getting around it if you were uh, sort of a, a sophisticated yeah. owner. So so we, we we didn't so much feel that the policy behind that current restriction is bad policy. We just didn't feel it was effective or that there was a, a, a way to make it uh, effective. Thank you. Um, Nick, can I raise a couple of points um, that attendees have, have raised with us um, on um, enforcement in the, in the common hold world uh, and in particular enforcement against common hold unit ho uh, owners who don't pay their share of the um, maintenance charges. So, so one of our attendees is saying, um, even currently with leaseholders owning their own freehold, there isn't much teeth to take action against leaseholders who simply don't comply with covenants. Uh, how will common hold help with this um, lack of bite? Um, and then another um, attendee talking about saying that it seems to her that the only option to recover service charge, charge stroke reverse, uh, reserve funds be to sue for common debt in the courts um, and then saying that she can't see how 
ensuring the money is needed for the maintenance and running of a building with common parts would be possible without the threat of loss of the investment. I mean, I think I think there is, isn't there, built into the proposal um, as a kind of a last resort, this idea of a, um, a an application to the um, courts for an, an order for sale of the common hall unit. But yeah, can you deal with the question of enforcement and teeth and how yeah. will, will help? Yeah, and we, we we were very keen to ensure that there was an enforcement. Uh, so there was an effective enforcement mechanism uh, so acknowledging <clears throat> that, that in a common hold the ability to uh, get the funds due from from unit owners uh, is very significant uh, you know, particularly in ensuring that, that the common hold remains uh, financially viable um, and that's one of the, the the things that runs sort of through uh, a number of recommendations we make that common holds do need to be financially robust um, so we have put in place uh, an enforcement mechanism that we think does have real teeth um, and avoids the need to rely on uh, suing for common debt. Um, essentially, um, if a common hold unit owner uh, has a debt of what we suggest a thousand pounds or a, a debt of any level that, that's been uh, in place for over a year, uh, the Common Hold Association will be able to bring proceedings uh, to have that unit sold uh, and the debt discharged out of the proceeds of sale. There is a sort of protective mechanism uh, around that uh, that um, sort of requires a Common Hold Association to uh, tell uh, the unit owner uh, that the debt is uh, there and that it's going to take uh, enforcement action. Um, to enter into discussions with the unit owner to try and come up with a payment plan, etc. So similar sorts of things that we're familiar with, with, with how a, a mortgage lender would be uh, required uh, to act. So all aimed initially at trying to uh, ensure that that money is paid, um, but with the, the prospect that if the money isn't paid, if the money can't be paid, uh, then it would go to court for an order for sale. Uh, and uh, the the debt would then be repaid out of um, the, the proceeds of sale. And as part of that package, because of course the, the other sort of significant player is, in this process is a mortgage lender, um, as part of that uh, package, uh, the Common Hold Association would also have to uh, tell the mortgage lender uh, that uh, the debt has accrued so that the mortgage lender has the opportunity uh, to step in. As a mortgage lender sort of may do now, there's a threat of forfeiture in the lease, uh, for example. So essentially, you know, th there is a mechanism there. We, we think it, it has teeth. It doesn't take away uh, the investment that the unit owner has built up. And of course, you know, we have separately recommended uh, the abolition of forfeiture. Uh, so the last thing we would want to do is replicate uh, that in a common hold situation because that the, the, the availability of forfeiture is very heavily criticized in the residential context as a draconian remedy uh, so instead it's an order for sale uh, with the the debt then uh, recovered and, and as i see it it actually it, it's a better remedy in a sense for the for the common hold unit owner than forfeiture was for a lessee because you don't have the element of windfall for the landlord you could have a yeah have a debt of two thousand pounds in respect of which the the lease which is worth a quarter of a million is sold and and the landlord keeps the the, the flat or whatever worth a quarter of a million to him whereas as i understand it under this proposal it goes to court for an order for sale and then a receiver is appointed yep. to um, deal with the sale the debt is then paid out of proceeds of sale and the common hold unit owner gets whatever remains yeah that, the, that that's absolutely market. right yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. So it's it's the, the the teeth of the forfeiture is still there, but in a rather more equitable way, um, yes. perhaps than than forfeiture allowed for. Yeah, yeah, and in fact, we we sort of modelled uh, the procedure we put in place to some extent on the procedure that we have recommended as uh, the replacement for forfeiture uh, so our recommendations for forfeiture replace forfeiture with uh, an order uh, for sale uh, and a procedure that we've put in place in common hold sort of mirrors uh, the procedure that we have recommended putting in place 
um, to terminate a tenancy uh, in place of forfeiture. So there is a, a bit of a parallel between them. Has yeah. there been a lot of discussion with lenders over the sort of proposed common hold reforms? Because obviously getting them on board is key to its success. Yeah, there has been. Um, and that enforcement mechanism is a very good illustration of that because in our consultation paper uh, we had suggested a different mechanism what we suggested there is that the common hold association would have a first charge over uh, the uh, unit uh, so that if debts accrued uh, the common hold association would be able to enforce the charge um, mortgage lenders were very unhappy uh, about that because it would mean that you know, the that the acquisition uh, mortgage was necessarily a second um, charge uh, and it's, it's in response in particular to their concerns that we've adopted the, this sort of very different approach and have modelled it on the termination of tenancies recommendations which mortgage lenders in that context accepted as uh, sufficient to protect their security. Um, so we you know we're very conscious of the fact that um, common hold needs the support of lenders uh, for it to take off, um, and there are a number of recommendations that we make that are designed to ensure um, that that the common hold uh, provides uh, adequate security. And in fact, we think it, it's better security. Um, then a, a leasehold is, uh, and the, 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 some some of those listening would no doubt have seen the the letter to lenders uh, that we published alongside our, our report, highlighting uh, the measures that we've taken to to protect the the security of their interest. Thanks. I am um, coming back to enfranchisement. I'll ask you a question about litigation costs. Um, I remember. Uh, hearing a lecture from David Newberger some time ago, uh, cautioning that the, the rise in alternative dispute resolution, mediation, arbitration, and so on, means that fewer controversial issues in property law get resolved by the courts, uh, thereby clarifying the law. Uh, your proposal is to remove the court's jurisdiction completely and shift everything to the first tier tribunal where each side normally pays their own costs. Uh, and that will presumably discourage cases uh, from being taken, uh, which would be needed to clarify some of the more difficult issues which are bound to arise, however well drafted the legislation is. Uh, the courts have had to resolve many issues in the current legislation uh, to the benefit of all, um, why shouldn't the loser pay the winner's costs? I, I think that, that that's a question we could probably spend the rest of the evening <laughs> discussing uh, and unpicking that, that there is a, a huge amount in it. Um, I, I would start by saying that that the move towards ADR, the move towards uh, tribunals rather than courts, I think is a, a trend across a number of areas. Um, and so you know, leasehold is a part of that. In terms of the tribunal, um, the, the, the tribunal jurisdiction, of course, ha has, it, ha has its own status in precedent uh, as well. So it doesn't remove uh, the, the, the fact that precedents uh, are created, albeit it, it moves them into a different, um, a, a different forum. The other part of my answer, I think, in part would be to say, uh, 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 why should the loser? pay um, because if litigation is arising because the law isn't clear um, there is a, a an argument um, that that the parties uh, shouldn't have to pay the costs in order to clarify uh, the law um, that not having a, a cost shifting um, jurisdiction is actually sort of perfectly that, that legitimate that the law is unclear two parties have taken uh, what you know, are reasonable interpretations of it and somebody has to adjudicate and decide wh wh which version will stand what what, what we don't know at the moment, I mean, you talk about uh, the, the risk of litigation, of people being deterred through litigation uh, under our regime. Um, it seems to us that quite likely that 
leaseholders at the moment could be quite heavily deterred from taking litigation to enforce their rights because of the risks of being held liable for uh, the costs incurred by their freeholder. Uh, and when you add into that equation, uh, so as we found in our valuation report, that there is a, a systemic inequality of arms uh, between leaseholders and freeholders, that could be having quite a significant impact on behaviour at the moment. Uh, if you're an individual homeowner um, and you know, your home uh, is your main asset and you're in an enfranchisement dispute with your freeholder the risk of becoming liable to, for your freeholders costs if you try and enforce your right through court is a, a significant barrier to, to actually asserting uh, your rights um, so i think we we see moving to a tribunal jurisdiction and taking away that that cost risk uh, is actually enabling people to enforce their rights in a way that they they don't necessarily feel able to at the moment. Could I um, just put the, the, <laughs> the foot for a moment? Yeah. Um, Natasha and I did a case, a um, well-known case called Agio, it went all the way to the um, House of Lords, which was successful for the tenant in the end, um, and it went through various stages. The tenant had to fight the landlord uh, because the landlord was objecting to the claim, and the tenant succeeded in the end. Why shouldn't the successful tenant in those circumstances get paid their costs they've been forced to go to court and eventually they won why should they have to be out of pocket the, and the, you're you're highlighting that the minority case where the current position did in fact work uh, for, for the benefit of the uh, leaseholder but looking at looking at the regime at looking at the regime systemically um, I think that, you know, that that is probably the exception rather than the rule and the behavioural impact on other leaseholders who, who didn't have um, you know, either the, the resources or, or, or the, 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 the doggedness uh, to, to do that is probably more significant than, than the impact on leaseholders who have benefited from the current rules. Yes, I think there's always a difficulty with irrecoverable costs as well. And, you know, well advised landlords can think up ingenious arguments and um, put tenants off effectively. Um, yeah. So I, I think I can see that certainly. But, but, but I know I, 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 I never get a barrister to agree with me on our cost proposals. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, 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 acting for both landlords and yes. tenants, my personal view is it's, yeah. it's, it's worth, uh, it stops people taking bad points if, uh, if the loser has to, to pay generally. And um, it means that there isn't a discouragement to have difficult points decided by the courts. I can see the other side as well, of course. Um, Nick, there's a question being asked by someone in our audience, which I think is it, it would be quite good for you to comment on. We're, we're beginning to run a little bit short of time, but, but it seemed to me that this is quite a, an important one. Um, he's saying, how can unit holders hold the Common Hold Association to account with the lack of any right to challenge, quote, service charge type expenditure after the event? Isn't there a risk that owners especially if they're in a minority or left without remedies um, if the association's funds are improperly spent, which I think I, I suspect is probably a concern of a, a lot of people in a practical sense um, of, of the, the new proposals. Well, we shift the uh, ability to hold the, uh, uh, the common hold association to account or the directors to account to the time when the budget is decided. Um, so you know, what we want to ensure under our recommendations is that at the time that money is spent, uh, the directors know that they have the approval uh, for that expenditure from the common hold unit owners. So I think under our recommendations, the unit holders uh, have uh, you know, a much greater 
uh, ability to hold uh, the directors uh, to account than they have um, in relation to their, their freeholder because the unit owners are voting on the budget and the budget can only go ahead if the unit owners uh, approve that budget. Um, now, there is always uh, a, a risk. I mean, that, that it's a company that, that runs um, that essentially on, well, that runs on company law principles. Um, so there is always uh, a risk of decisions being made that aren't popular with, with uh, everyone. Um, we accept um, that, you know, that to some extent that is how a company runs uh, and you have to be able to to enable uh, sort of directors to go ahead on the basis of, of a vote uh, that has been taken but uh, significantly we supplement that with uh, protection uh, for uh, a, a sort of minority uh, uh, minorities within the vote who can uh, challenge uh, in some instances uh, the decision that has been made and in the case of uh, uh, the decisions on a budget again that challenge would be made before the money uh, is spent so that we don't end up in a situation where the directors are spending money and then find out that the budget uh, is you know, has not in fact been validly approved and of course you no know, uh, uh, around that uh, the, the directors are directors of a company and are accountable uh, as any director uh, of a company would be uh, in terms of how they ca carry out their duties so I think we would say that in a common hold uh, the unit owners have much more control over uh, the budget uh, then uh, that they have in leasehold and of course fundamentally in common hold uh, it is the unit owners who are uh, d deciding um, how the money is spent and you know, who, who carries out works etc or who manages uh, the building by appointing by the unit owners choosing who to appoint as managing uh, agents so that there is much more direct uh, accountability to the unit owners in common hold than there is in leasehold at the moment. You're, you're still going to have the problem, I mean I appreciate that the the emphasis shifts to approval of the budget before the work is carried out but you're still going to have the age-old problem of um, the work then being done to a, a terrible standard or not being done properly or or, or, or you know it just not being managed properly and then the question i suppose is well how do the common hold unit holders um, deal with that mm. um, as against the common hold association well, they are members uh, of the common hold uh, association so again you know, that, that they are that they are much closer to the decision makers the decision makers are their neighbors um, so you know th th there is a much closer relationship there uh, for them to, you know, if they're not happy with the, the quality of the work, for them to um, sort of follow that up uh, with, with the directors or with, with the managing agent who they have appointed. Um, so, yeah, no, yes, th those issues are still uh, going to arise, um, but you know, we think the... <laughs> The, the, the fact that the all of the unit owners are the members of the common hold association um, and all share the same interest means that there there is going to be a a more common interest uh, in uh, sort of in ensuring that works are done to the appropriate uh, standard. Um, I think we've now uh, reached the end of our allotted time. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, Nick Hopkins once again for his excellent lecture and also for answering so many questions so fully. Um, thank you also to my fellow panellists uh, and on behalf of Janet Bignall, the Blundell Chair, uh, thanks to James Tipler and Imogen Dodds for their work on making this event happen. Um, finally, can I remind you that the final Blundell lecture is on the 14th of October. Uh, it is on leases and frustration, a very topical uh, subject of interest at the moment uh, and that will be delivered by Anthony Tanny of Falcon Chambers and there will be a panel comprising Adam Rosenthal, QC, Camilla Lamont and Francis Richardson. Uh, goodbye and thank you all very much for your attendance and participation. Uh, and that ends the Blundell Lecture. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Tony.